Yeah, uh, thank you, Biksha. It's always nice to be here. Yeah, so I guess today I'm not going to talk much about research, but just kind of give a broad overview of continual learning. And maybe there'll be a few questions which I'll leave you with, and maybe a few answers. So yeah, let's get started. <laughs> so I mean, as we all know, it's a very, very exciting time to be in AI right now. We have computer programs which surpass human performance at the game of Go, at playing different kinds of Atari games. We have computer vision systems which can segment images in great detail and very accurately. And we also have made these impressive robots. Right? But if you look at these systems in slightly more detail, right? so for example, if I want to teach a computer what is a zebra, the way I do it today is to show it lots and lots of images of zebra. Right? So behind every successful image recognition system, there exists a human farm. Similarly, if I look at the successes which have come in the domains of Go or in domains of Atari games, they have come in simulation where it is possible to take a gazillion number of interactions. And in many scenarios, such as the game of Go, we actually know the rules of the game. Right? And these algorithms end up being very, very specific to one task. So for example, if I have something which plays a chess on an eight cross eight board, it's very hard for it to work on a nine cross nine board. Right? Forget about something working on chess, generalizing to some other game. Right? And similarly, if you see these robots from Boston Dynamics, they are doing some very impressive feats, but that's all they are doing, right? I mean, it's very impressive that by engineering the system, we can make it do these kind of backflips. But this is the only thing the system can do. Right? So in a way, the AI that we have made today ends up being very, very specific to one particular task. Right? And what we want to do is to build AI which can do a variety of tasks, right? So the question is, how do we get there? Right. <laughs> so let's, let's first try to define what we mean by an AI system which can do many tasks, or what, what, what do we mean by this, right? So one, uh, <clears throat> one, one typical definition is that we want the systems to be able to reuse their past knowledge to be able to solve tasks which, which are given to them in the future. Right? It's something we as humans do all the time. We always leverage our past knowledge and combine it in interesting ways to solve novel problems that are given to us. Right? We can concretize that and say, okay, we want to make systems which by solving n tasks, learn to either do the n plus one it task much faster, or they're able to solve a new task which is much more complex. Right? So this is what we, we this is, these are the kind of systems we want to build. Now let's see in, in deep learning or in AI what kind of successes we have had in this paradigm of building systems or building agents. Right? For the most successful example is on image recognition where people have trained deep networks which take images as inputs and output uh, what objects are in those images. So typically ImageNet ends up having 1,000 images per class and there are 1,000 classes, so it's around a million images. And when you train the system end to end, you can give it an image and it can predict whether it has an elephant, a dog, or a cat, and so on. Right? So in a way, what I have done is I have, I have, by training, so over here you're seeing this neural network, so by training this neural network, I have captured the knowledge of how to classify images in the weights of this deep network, right? And now, and, and now what I can do is I can ask that if there is a different task, right? For example, consider that I give you apples and oranges, and if I want to classify apples from oranges. So the question is, can I leverage uh, the knowledge which was there in the networks by training on a lot of different classes and use that to somehow make the task of classifying apples from oranges much faster. Right? So we know that these kind of things can be done, and the most straightforward way of doing this is what people call as fine tuning, which is you have a set of weights which you have learned on your ImageNet model, 
and then you modify them to small extent when you get this new data, which could be labeled data in forms of you get images of apples with the tag apple, you get images of oranges with the tag orange. Right? So while on ImageNet we required like around 1,000 examples per class, maybe now we require hundreds of examples per class. Right? So there's a big reduction in how much data we require in order to solve a new task in this scenario. Right? But 100 is still a lot of data points that we require. Right? I mean, can we do something better than this? Right? Can we make it like one data point or like a couple of data points? Right? So, I mean, if, if you only have a couple of data points, you really can't do any fine tuning of your network. Right? Because if you have your weights, if you have one data point or two data points, the weights won't change too much. And if you were to iteratively keep applying gradient descent on those few examples, you'll just end up overfitting to those one or two examples. Right? So fine-tuning won't really be a solution if you only have a couple of examples. Right? So what, what kind of things can we do in that context? Right? So the first thing, so let, let us define the problem. Right? So I give you one image of, say, an apple I'm calling x1 and the label is Y1, and there's one image of an orange, the image is X2, and the label is Y2. Right? And I give you a test image, and the question is, is it an apple, or is this an orange? Right? So one thing, I mean, which my deep network gives me when I've trained it for classification, is that it takes this high dimensional image and converts that into a feature space. And this feature space ends up typically being much lower dimension than the image itself. Right? So the image might be, for example, 224 cross 224 cross 3, and this feature space might be 1,000 to 2,000 dimensional. Right? So it's a compression of my data. And, 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 and people have found that these feature spaces have semantically relevant information. Right? So one thing we could do is we can say, well, we can do nearest neighbors that I have a feature representation of my current image, I can find the feature representation of my apple, or I can find the feature representation of my orange, and I can find the distance in the feature space. Right? And that distance, and I can look at which of these images have a lower distance in my feature space, and then choose that as the correct class. Right? This is like the age old technique of using data which I have in the past to do some matching. Right? So now, you probably don't want to do matching in the image space, because in the image space, for example, even if I, there's some translation between, say, the apple, like even if it is translated slightly, you might still get a very big distance. Right? In the feature space, you have abstracted out the notion of where the apple might be. Right? And the other abstractions that you're making, which makes doing such comparisons in feature space much more useful than doing the same comparisons in the raw pixel space. Right. So, but the, so now let's think one step deeper into this. Right? So we're talking about this feature space. Right? So the performance of our nearest neighbor classifier is going to depend on the feature space which we have learned through this process of doing classification of these thousand classes. Right? So do you think that there could be any issues when I end up using this feature space Z? <laughs> or, or is there probably a more uh, optimal way of learning feature space Z if what I want to do is to use nearest neighbors to classify what my new image is going to be? So that's one suggestion. Does anyone has any other suggestions? Anyone? 9 a.m. They don't have suggestions. 9 a.m. No coffee. <laughs> right. So, so, so if, if you think about like the, the process of training, right? You have trained this network to classify images into thousand different categories, right? And what you're hoping is that by this process, as a side effect, your feature space will end up having the right characterization that if you end up doing nearest neighbors, you will still find the correct class. 
right? I mean, there's no reason why this should be the case, right? I mean, this, if this happens, this would be an emergent property of your feature space, right? So instead of just relying on the fact that this thing would emerge, what we can do is explicitly go and train for that, right? So now, how, how can I train for that? Now, that typically ends up in the context of uh, metric learning. So how do we do metric learning? What do, what do I mean by metric learning? I'll try to now detail that, right? So essentially, instead of doing one versus all classification, which we were doing right now to learn my feature space Z, we're going to learn the feature space Z by metric learning, right? So I have my image, right, of a dog over here. And suppose this is a randomly initialized network for now, right? It will still transform my dog image into some features, right? Call these features Z1, right? And I put a second image. This is the same network with the same parameters, right? And it's going to transform the image into a different, into a, into a different set of features, uh, Z2, right? Now, what I want is if the images come from the same class, I would say, uh, that I want my output to be one. That means that the that, that means that the features uh, should be so, so Z1 and Z2 belong to the same class. So, the, and if my images, oh, okay, let, okay, let's let's hold for a bit. So let's say I have my two images of a dog. I get two features Z1 and Z2. If 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 the images are from the same class. I want to say that they, they should map to one class, say class one. And if I get these images from a different class, so I get an image of a dog and an image of a chair, now these two are different categories. So I want this to be zero, right? So just for notation, these neural networks are represented by uh, function phi with parameters theta, right? And the way we're going to learn these parameters is by saying I want to optimize my embedding that I'm learning, which is Z, and the comparison function, which operates on my features, so that I map, class, I map examples from the same class into similar features, and map examples from different classes to be far away from each other, right? And now, when I get a new example, I can use this network to predict what class it belongs to, right? So traditionally, these networks have been called Siamese networks, right? So this is like a classic paper from 2006 from Raya Hatzel, right? So, so using it is pretty trivial. Now again, going back to our example, we have this orange over here, right? So how do we use it? We'll compare it with the apple, and we compare it with the orange image in our training set. Right. And now I get two scores. For example, this might output 0.1 because this guy is not like the apple. It might output 0.8. Right? So I can just compare the scores, and I will know what the output would be. Right. This makes sense? Right. OK. <laughs> so you can also, if you want to look at more advanced methods in this topic, you can look at matching networks, which came out of DeepMind a couple of years ago. So now let's look at this question from a different perspective. Right? So what we have been trying to do is to say, I, I pre-train my model on some task. Right? I mean, in, in the first case, we pre-trained on ImageNet. Then in the second case, we pre-trained to do some matching. Right? So essentially, uh, what I end up with is a point in my feature space, or a point in my parameter space, say theta which is done by solving for some task which I have done until now. Now I get a new task. Right? So suppose the new task is to classify apples versus orange. So what I am doing is I am trying to find a different set of parameters. And the fine, what the fine tuning is doing is taking you from this point in the parameter space to a second point in the parameter space. Right? And if I have a different task, say dog versus cat, then again, I start with my pre-trained network, and I want to go to a different point in my feature space, say theta 2. Right? So essentially, what is happening in fine-tuning 
is that I'm, I'm trying to move in my parameter space or in my weight space by either delta theta one for the task one or delta theta two for task two. Right? So if I want to make my process of fine tuning be more efficient, right? is there something that I can do over here? Like given the picture that we have painted of what is happening during the fine tuning process. Any suggestions? Choose a theta so that delta theta one and delta theta two will be less. <laughs> so choose a theta so delta theta one and delta theta two will be less. Right. Okay. Any any other suggestions? Or does everyone agree with him, disagree with him? No. Okay, so, I, so, I, so his point is that I have no information about theta one and theta two to start off from. So it's, it will be very hard for me to do anything smarter, right? Okay, let's, let's, I'll, I'll come to your point, yeah. So I'm thinking about uh, whether we can scale the distance, scale the whole distance down, and then scale the norm of the, the theta down, so that the distance between the theta <laughs> So what, what would happen so if I scale something down, would it fundamentally change anything? Right? Suppose if the distances were measured in meters, mm -hmm. and now you start measuring in centimeters, right? the, the distance still remains the same, right? Because then if you're taking gradients, then you also move in smaller units. Right? When you're doing backprop, right, there's a term which comes in which is weight times the error signal. So if you scale down your weights, your gradients also get scaled down by the same amount. I didn't even want the delta theta ones. Does, does that make sense to you? That I mean, if you just scale the weights, not, nothing is going to change in the system. So your distance will become smaller, right? But then your gradients will also become smaller, so you will still have to take a lot of gradient steps. The angular loss function. If you do some normalization on the loss function, it will uh, try to get rid of the effect on the, uh, the length of the weight. Yeah, so the normalization of a loss function is fundamentally very different from normalization of your uh, parameter space, mm -hmm. right? So that is something which, 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 which is worth thinking about, like how like normalizing a loss function might end up being different than normalizing your parameters. Right, because you, you are uniformly uh, reduce, you are uniformly scaling all the parameters. Right? If you could scale the parameters in different ways, the different parameters have different scaling, then that would have a very different effect. So right. ideally you really want the dog versus cat and apple versus orange to be very different so that the two deltas are very, you know, capture most of the task, live in different subspaces maybe, right? So you want to live in different subspaces. Only the deltas, so they want the deltas to be as orthogonal as possible. Now, why, why is that? So in, the, in the sense that if they're not, then your theta is not act, you're still assuming, assuming that the two tasks, task one and task two, are very related, right? In the sense that, so in that sense, your theta is already pretty close to the final task. Okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe getting to the right, right direction to some extent. You had a you had a comment. Um, no, no. I was just wondering if you could somehow transform the feature space in a way so that uh, this is easier. Uh, this task of maybe this movement between the theta to theta one or theta two is easier in some sense. So transform the feature space. Maybe like, like so that's what we did with SVMs when we evolved the statistical linear boundaries mm -hmm. and. Like you, you could just go about uh, like uh, defining any other boundary you wanted by just transforming the feature space. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's it's not the same thing, but it's, it's an analogy I think we can. Use. We can try to make use of. So you're saying that about the, what you were doing with the kernel trick in SVMs, right? Like that, that you were doing something where you're transforming your feature space, so distances become smaller, or or the distances become more meaningful, right? I mean, in the kernel in the kernel thing, 
you are not really changing the distance between the features, right? What you are saying is some, in some feature space, I am linearly separable. In other feature space, I am not linearly separable. There is a different concept than distance, right, fundamentally. Right? So the kernel transformation is not changing your distances, typically. It's just linearizing it in a higher dimensional space. Right? I mean, it's, it's a good line of thought. I mean, it can we do something to transform it, right? I mean, for example, he mentioned scaling. Scaling is one simple kind of transformation. You can say I want to come up with more generic kind of transformations, which, which is a good food for thought, right? But I mean, it could be a, it could be a possibility that you could do something like that, but you, you have to be clever. That because you can't uniformly scale everything. If you uniformly scale everything, then nothing is going to change, right? So, so what happens if I have, say, 10 delta thetas, and if I can't make them orthogonal? Like, what would happen in that case? So I mean, in this scenario, it seems like I only have two thetas, so I can make them orthogonal. But what happens if I have a lot of tasks? Then you can have a lot of features. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in theory, these, these feature spaces end up being like really, really big. You don't have as many tasks as number of parameters. So you can always make them orthogonal if you wanted to make them orthogonal. Yeah. I had a question, so why would you want to make them orthogonal? Because in some cases the tasks can be related, right? Mm -hmm. Like for example, say task one is dog versus cat. Yeah. Task two is uh, between two varieties of dogs. Yeah. So would you want to make them orthogonal in all cases or would it just be when you being them completely different? Yeah, I mean that's a suggestion made by the two classmates. <laughs> 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 the common thing then that maybe the first start point can cover the common part. And from that part, delta can make a difference. That's the point where we can discriminate. I mean, so, so I guess what, what he's trying to say is that, I mean, for example, when you do PCA, right, you subtract the mean, and then everything becomes closer because you subtract something which is common, right? So if you think in that way, you're trying to remove some bias, which is adding extra distance, right? But that goes back to the point he was mentioning that you need to know like where these points are. But you don't know those points in advance. So I mean, how would you orthogonalize that if you don't know those points in advance? Yeah. Um, so maybe like uh, when you're doing transfer learning this way, uh -huh. maybe you can do some meta learning where you can define some kind of similarity between the tasks or difference between the tasks as you're moving from one task to another. So can you, can you elaborate on that a bit more? So maybe you could, def you could probably learn the angle or the, or the distance you're moving, angle between the vectors, uh, the, the paths taken or the or distance you're moving as you're moving from one task to another and maybe you can map it to what you're learning. So when, when say like you're, you're first learning to uh, classify cats from dogs and then dogs from dogs and then suddenly you switch to something very different yeah. like dogs from inanimate things you'll know it's not in the same it's, it's going to change drastically you'll have some notion of where you're heading okay so you're saying is if i have solved many tasks before then i have some notion of how i should change my gradients if the tasks are related right so if you have solved cats versus dogs before and now i go say cats versus donkeys, right? Then because I know how where cats versus dogs are, I might know something about where cats versus donkeys are, and I can use that information to kind of move faster somehow in the parameter space, right? That's, that's kind of what you're trying to say. Yeah? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we play on the feature space instead of changing the, the feature chapter itself. But I think because it's trained on the image net, so it has very good general features. So the only task is to pick up some features and then ensemble them to a new classifier. Yeah, so what you're suggesting is just forget about the parameter space totally 
go to the feature space and say that my new task is some linear combination in my feature space or some or nonlinear combination in my feature space and then train that, right? Yeah. But that is exactly what a multi-layer network does, right? Uh, exactly I mean, this is exactly what is happening when you're training your neural network, right? If, if, you, if you're just fine-tuning, like in fine-tuning, this is exactly what you're doing. Yeah, but that, but that, that is your new theta, right? So that theta which you have frozen, plus the new thing that you are training. So you're going to save. So you're going. To, so you're not going to change the theta, but you have to then train something on top of it, yes. right? Yeah, so I mean, so other way you could do is you can say that if I have n layers in my network, I'm going to freeze n minus one layers and just train the last layer, yes. right? I mean, that is something which, which could be done, right? So what is the trade-off? What is the trade-off between just training the last layer versus training all the layers? Uh, we save the computation. At, at, what, at what expense? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you, there's an expense that if you have, maybe if you have only a couple of data points, it makes sense because you're not going to change too much. So you can just tune your last layer, and that might save you the amount of computation, right? So I guess then the first question, which I never answered or I should never pose, was what am I trying to optimize, right? So I guess I'm not trying to save on my compute time per se, but like how many gradient steps I want to take. Right, so if you, can, if you think of a system which is deployed, right, you want the system to very quickly adapt. So what does quick adaptation mean? Quick adaptation means that I only need to make a few changes to my current set of parameters, and I should go and do the new task. Right, this is exactly what quick adaptation means. Right, so in your scenario, you, would, you might be able to be more efficient in a way of saving on the compute, but you still might to take a lot of gradients step before you, you converge to a good solution. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Uh, and now, just uh, I think we are here uh, implicitly assuming that the theta has some relation to the theta one or theta two, I mean, to relation to the task. Well, let's say theta could be some dog versus something else. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. So that, that is some direction we should go for in the task two, I think. So, yeah, so in some ways it's a, it's a, it's a good idea to, that you can do that. But, but also think about the fact that distinguishing between dogs and cats might be fundamentally different between distinguishing between dogs and furniture. Okay. Right? Here I think uh, my point here is that I think before I look, when I look at a human, when we said we learn a dog, we were never confused by other cats or something else because mm -hmm. we learn the dog itself. Mm -hmm. No matter what else you show me, yeah. I can recognize the dog. Yeah. So I think that has some um, inherent in the, that network too. Whenever in a theta, we have the task to, dis, uh, to tell whether it is a dog. And for all those ways that contribute to this task, should also be true for the theta one because yeah. we believe that is there is something, yeah. some way that could actually tell the dog, yeah. no matter what else, what other task can be, what other yeah. can be. Yeah. So that's the main idea behind it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good suggestion. And yeah, I mean, that is definitely something worth pursuing and seeing how much it can help you to do that, right? I mean, I guess, I mean, everyone has, I mean, I think you all are kind of thinking in the right directions through different ways. I have something specific in my mind which I'm going to go into, and I'm, I'll try to motivate why that thing and why not anything else. But I think all the ideas that you guys were saying are kind of, it just, this figure was just to kind of tease you a little bit. 
so that you start kind of thinking about what you want to do. I mean, what fine tuning is about? Fine tuning is about moving in the parameter space, right? That's essentially what fine tuning is about. And when we want our system to adapt quickly, one way to think about it is that I want my fine tuning to be as fast as possible. Right? I mean, there are other ways in which you can pose this problem. I pose it in a very particular way, which is I want to make my fine tuning faster. Right? Now, fine tuning way of uh, learning from a few examples is quite different from what we saw in the Siamese network style. Right? Like over there, there was no gradient changes I was making. I was not doing any fine tuning. Right? I had learned a model of that there are these, uh, that images which belong to one class should be mapped together, and images which belong to a different class should be mapped separately, right? So in that case, there was no fine tuning at all. Right? In this case, I'm coming back to the fine tuning paradigm and then working in that, right? So I guess whenever we look at a problem, we should first look at, I mean, what mechanism or method, or method we're going to follow to solve it, right? Many times there are different methods, and each method would have its own pros and cons. For example, some might say, well, I don't really want to do any gradient descent at test time. Right? It's not required. Right? Because our brains are already structured in the right way by experience that we don't want to change anything in the brain, but there are mechanisms which can help me adapt. Right? The other point of view could be that, no, I fundamentally want to change my weights. And there are mechanisms which can change my weights as fast as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah, you have a question. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. So it's an excellent question. What happens in that case? I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah hold, hold your question for like 15, maybe 10 minutes, depending on how the discussion goes. <laughs> and we'll, we'll come to it. Yeah. Any other comments, suggestions? Any? Yeah. Do we have like a notion of generalizability that is, uh, so when we say general, how general do we mean, or uh, what tasks do we want to adapt uh, for given a training model? Because that seems very open. Yeah, that's a good question. That, that, that could have been the first question you could have asked me. <laughs> First, define your premise, right? I mean, in what premise I'm operating in, right? I mean, so in, in, we are operating in the standard machine learning premise over here that your testing distribution comes from the training distribution is somehow correlated, right? If those two things have no correlation, then there could be, can be no learning by definition. So we're operating under that premise. All we're trying to say is, okay, here is one dumb way which we know today of how to make use of my pre-trained weights, which is fine tuning. I mean, in some ways it's dumb, in some ways it's very, very useful, right? I mean, we, yeah. And I mean, can we do something better than that? I mean, that's the, that's the whole question, right? So, and, but the premise is still the same. It has, has some correlation with the task. If it has no correlation, then you can't really do anything. I mean, you could construct an alternative where you say, okay, I, I am going to do a hard task. I don't know how to do this hard task. So let me pose myself a simpler task which I can do so I can learn something about my hard task. Right? I mean, that could be something more general, but let's not go into that for now. Right? Let's just say standard supervised learning and the standard test distribution, same as training distribution. OK. Any, any other comments, questions, anything? No? OK. So. Okay, I think some of you got this intuition, I think, pretty early. That what you want to do is to reduce the amount of fine tuning essentially is the distance that you're traveling, right? Delta theta one plus delta theta two. And what I want to do is to reduce this amount of distance I am traveling, right? So what if my thetas were over there, right? Then the distance I'm going to travel is going to be very, very small, right? But the thing is, how do I find this theta? I mean, that's, that's the question. So instead, of, so, so instead of thinking that I have first pre-trained my weights, and then I'm going to change them to go to a new task, is saying, can I find a set of weights from which if I take a step, I reach my target task very quickly? Right? So you are trying to actually change the, the, initial, the initial set of weights itself 
to say that can I change those initial set of weights so that given any task, the number of steps I need to take to solve that task is going to be small. Right? So I can pose that as an optimization problem. Right? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yes, no, so to how many people it makes sense? To how many people it's like, I, I have no idea what you're saying. No one. Everyone had their coffee, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Will them have a lower accuracy than the previous one or not? Yes, yes, there's a trade-off, right? I mean, there's a trade-off between being very good at one task and being general, yes. right? I mean, that is a fundamental trade-off. That's going to be there everywhere. Right? I mean, even as humans, right? I mean, some of us are very, very good at playing water polo. Some of us are very, very good at doing math. And I know human can do everything, right? So there will be a trade-off between how good you are at one task versus how general you are. Right? But I think in some ways when we say we want to make intelligent agents, we are somehow talking about agents which can adapt quickly. Right? Until now, in AI, we have made agents which are very, very good for doing one task. Right? But the question you are raising is a very good question. Right? There will be, be that trade-off, yes. Right, so how, how do we mathematically pose this? So, okay, this is what I actually said. This is again what I said. Can we optimize theta to make fine tuning easier? So, <coughs> just consider if I have my parameters theta right now, and I'm saying my loss function for task one is as following, where f is my neural network, and theta are the parameters of my neural network. And I'm trying to minimize this loss function on task one. Right? So if I'm trying to minimize this, what do I do? Right? I'm going to take one gradient step towards that point. Right? Now suppose this is theta one prime. If theta one prime is theta minus, alpha is your learning rate, or whatever step you want to take, you go there. That is a theta one prime. Right? Now what do I do? Now I say that I want my theta, I want, to minim I want to find a theta so that if I just took one step, I, I reach the minimum, right? Or I find the optimal solution for task one, right? So what I'm just saying is that I'm just taking one step. So I want to find the parameters theta so that if I just take one step from it, I end up finding the optimal solution for the task I care about. Right? This is exactly what this uh, equation is saying. Right? So now if I have n tasks, I can generalize it and say I want the thetas. So if I go, if I just take one step for any of those tasks, I should try to find the optimal. Right? Now it is not necessary I'm going to find this, but it will push me towards that solution. It will push me, there's no guarantee I'm going to find that such a theta. Right? But we try to force me to find thetas from which I, I require only a few steps to go to a solution. Right? Does it make sense? Right? So, yeah. So now, yeah. So this approach, I mean, some people have called this meta learning, and other people have like published in not calling it meta learning. So I mean, like 2016, there was a paper. 2017, there was a paper. So, but yeah, I mean, this is like. So, so we talked about like two kind of paradigms, right? One is a fine-tuning paradigm. The fine-tuning, the first paradigm was, I just take my pre-trained weights, I fine-tune everything. And then I have a choice between, do I fine-tune the last layer, do I fine-tune the, the entire network, right? And there are trade-offs between them. And then we made it slightly smarter to say that I want to optimize for the fact that I want to be efficient at fine-tuning, right? The second thing we considered was more the Siamese network setup, where we are saying, I don't want to do any gradient updates, and I still want to be able to quickly solve the new task. Right? So those are kind of two different 
paradigms we have looked at, right? So fine tuning, nearest neighbor matching. The issue with nearest neighbor matching was we did not know if the feature space we learned from ImageNet is going to be inappropriate. So we said, let's go and learn that. We came to Siami's thing. We went back and looked at some meta learning stuff, right? Cool. So, yeah. So, but, but then again, let's think about the question of transfer. So if I end up, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, so there's a very subtle difference over there, right? So subtle difference is as following. So what you do is this between this is what you do in fine tuning, right? So you have your loss function defined with respect to task one, and you're trying to change your parameters to minimize this loss function, right? This is your standard fine tuning, right? right? It's like, uh, is it stochastic gradient descent? It's stochastic gradient descent. You have a set of parameters, you run stochastic gradient descent, you are fine tuning for a new task, right. right? Now, okay, now what is the difference between this and this? Right over here you have theta one prime, right? So what you are saying now is that I am not optimizing at my current parameter where I am, right? What I'm saying is that suppose I'm at some parameter and I take one step from the, that parameter and this should be the minimum of my new task. So find me the parameter theta, so that if I just take one step from it, I magically end up at the minimum, right? The first one was, I am over here, I don't care where the minimum is, I'll just I'll keep running towards that till the time I find the minimum. This is what fine tuning is doing. Right? What this is doing is saying, I want to go, I, I want to travel the world and find a spot, so that if I just move by one step, I can find my optimal, right? Does that clarify? Yeah, but how do we sort of try to do this for all of the tasks under consideration? So then you average across all the tasks, right? You say, I want to find a point which is one step away from everything, but it won't be one step away, right? So we'll end up finding sub, 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 some suboptimal solution. So for a few times it might be 20 steps away, for a few times it might be two steps, for some times it might be one step away. It would be, it would, the hope is it would be better than just running for a far distance, right? Does that, does that clarify? Yeah. yeah. Some bad intention, uh, bad intention. So for, in this situation, is the TI <coughs> known during training? Yeah, TI is known during training. And, and then for the case of the origin app for classification, mm -hmm. is this type known? So, so you can do it in both ways. So, in some ways, you can, so what you have to do is that you that you give your network some tasks to train on. So it tries to find that good like spot, yeah. and then you can potentially give it newer tasks. Yeah. But there has to be some correlation, right? I mean, it can't be a completely new task. So because what you have said, suppose if, if I had 50 tasks which I have solved until now, right? So what I am doing in those 50 tasks is to say, I want to be in part of the world where I am very close to all the tasks, yeah. right? So you are assuming the new task you're going to get is somehow similar to the task that you have solved. Okay. So therefore, I should also be faster for that new task. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any, yeah, go on. Are very what? Um, are very near. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it, it might not find a solution at all, right? It might not find a solution at all. The question is, is it going to be better than just fine tuning or not? Okay. Right? That, that's the only question. I'm not saying this will find that solution. This is how we are formulating the problem. But it might find some crappy solution. The thing is, that crappy solution better than fine tuning or not? That, that's, the, that's the only claim. Or that's the only intuition behind why to do this formulation. 
Yeah, go on. So we still will be fine tuning to find the Jupiter <coughs> dance parameters. Mm -hmm. Are we uh, working in a one shot or a few shot paradigm or is it, do we have access to more data? Ah, uh, you would typically work in a few shot paradigm for that too. I mean, you could have more data too if you want, but typically you end up working in a few short paradigm. You are basically practicing, saying that I expect and my test I'm only going to get a few examples. So let me choose 50 tasks and let me practice on those 50 tasks of how should I react when I'm only going to get few data points. So that once I get a few data points, I know how to deal with few data points. So but isn't the error sort of compounded? Uh, so the error which occurs during fine tuning because of having very few examples, isn't that compounded by taking the gradient step and finding the right parameters to start with? Uh, so, 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 think, so, so think about it in a way that, okay, what are you doing in fine tuning? Is this a, I'm, I'm, I'm theta, okay, I want, I'm going to change my theta for an, uh, some amount of time till that time I end up in a local optima, right? This is what I'm doing in standard fine tuning. Now I'm trying to say is by having solved 20 different tasks, I have some idea. For example, let's consider this room, right? I know that, okay, maybe, uh, if I have to solve any task, I have to be somewhere in that part of the room, right? But somehow, by ImageNet, I ended up over here, right? So what I found out is if I, if I go over there, then any task you give me, I can very quickly go to any of those tasks. Right? So the test time, the fine-tuning procedure is going to be the same for the standard fine-tuning and after this meta-learning when you do fine-tuning. But the thing is the initial, the point that you're starting off are different points. So the hope is the point you're starting off in the meta learning case, you would end up going to your solution quicker, because that is what you have optimized for at the train time. Sorry if I wasn't clear. So yeah. what I was basically asking is, does having fewer examples in a one shot or a few shot paradigm harm? Like oh, you're saying okay. So if you just had a lot of examples on ImageNet to begin yeah, with, wouldn't that be a better way to uh, train the new, the second uh, loss function that we have? Because more accurate estimates of this will help you reach a more generalizable. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. You can do that. Yeah. I mean, I don't think the systematic study has, I don't think has been done, which will have actually looked into what happens when you have 5 or 50 or 100 or 500. I mean, your point is correct. If you have more examples, the gradient estimate would be better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry, I went on to the circle once again. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's see. How much time do we have? We don't have enough time, but let's see where we can reach. <laughs> right, so, okay, we have discussed this, this, this. Yeah, so essentially, okay, if, if, I want, if, I'm, if I'm trying to do some, any, any form of transfer, right? So what I have learned on my current tasks is going to tell me how well I'm going to transfer. Right, that's the fundamental truth. So, okay. In practice, we say, okay, ImageNet is awesome, right? I give you this dog image, I put this through classifier, I get amazing 80% accuracy or some insane number, which is superhuman, on that ImageNet data set, right? Now, I, I go, I take my mobile phone out, I take a photo, I get this photo, ah, 20%, right? I mean, what happened? Why, why is it 20%? I thought ImageNet has 1,000 images. Right, what happened over here, right? So let's maybe try to understand like what happened over here, right? I mean, one thing is in ImageNet, if you see all pictures are taken by people who want to take a photograph, right? Everything is centered, you are in a photographic position, you take a photo and you use that data, right? This data is kind of, kind of out of domain for the ImageNet network, right? So to make the point even more concrete, Suppose I want to identify cars. Now I collect some positives of cars and I collect some negatives. Then I put in my heaviest machine learning tool I have, my deep neural network on this task, and then train it, right? And I get this brand new image, right? And I say, okay, network tell me, is it a car or not? So what do you think will happen? What, 0.5? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Anyone has a strong opinion? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, who knows, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, the thing to realize is that if I was training for this particular task, right, there's no way I can tell the network what to look for. It could discriminate saying, oh, all of these have roads in it, right? So I could learn a classifier which is roads versus trees. So when I go on this image, oh, there are no roads, right? So this cannot be a car, right? So this is an inference you could draw. So there are many different ways in which you can learn a function, right? And I have no control over it. This is one of the, those things which if you're doing SVMs, you have your kernel functions, right? Kernel functions defines a family of functions. If you have a linear kernel, you know I'm looking for linear functions. If you have a polynomial kernel, you know I'm looking for a poly polynomial functions, right? Over here, I have no idea, right? I'm clueless. I'm just hoping, praying in the dark, that somehow find the right thing, but I might not be able to find the right thing, right? And this data set bias ends up happening everywhere, right? I mean, this was a contrived data set I, I constructed. Right? But even ImageNet is in some ways contrived too. Right? It is the photographer's bias. So unless you're going to capture everything in the world, it's going to be very hard for you to get rid of data set biases, right? So now, okay, so now how, how do I deal with this issue? Right? And I mean, if I'm going to construct even deeper networks, okay, which are going to have more and more number of parameters, this problem is going to become even more and more compounded. Now, why is that? Based on increasing the VC dimension of the classifier. Okay, you are not allowed to speak. <laughs> Anyone from row two can speak for this question, then you can allow to speak from the next slide onwards. So the question is that, oh, I give the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is that if I have deeper networks, right? So my, my claim is that, okay, we, learned, we, we, we can learn some correlations which are unintended, right? For example, I, I could have learned the fact that the road versus tree is a feature which tells you whether there is a car or not. Right? So, so it's, it's a kind of a spurious correlation right, that, that I have learned based on the bias in my training set. Right? So now if my networks become deeper, right, am I going to learn more of these spurious correlations or am I going to learn fewer of these spurious correlations? More. more. Why, why more? So say you have the road versus the kind of yeah so you have a highly parameterized model so you have more number of parameters so the class the family of functions you're looking for is even larger right so you will end up finding for more spurious correlations so the deeper the network is the bigger the network is the less control you have on what the network is actually learning right so okay now, what do I do? Right? I mean, people have done many things in machine learning. I mean, some come up with regularization techniques exactly for this, right? I mean, if you think about dropouts and stuff, are exactly trying to address this problem, right? I mean, there are many, many things which could be done. I'll just stick to one thing for now, right? And this is saying that maybe this problem can be avoided if I am solving a bunch of simple tasks first, and then I try to solve complex tasks later on. And instead of trying to solve calculus, first let me like, study addition, multiplication, and then maybe I can go and study calculus. Right? So in the same way, if I'm solving simpler problems first, maybe, and maybe I'll have smaller networks also to solve the simpler problems. So I'm finding the right uh, solutions to the problems. And then when I go to more complex problems, I'm building on those right solutions. Right? I mean, that's one hypothesis. But I know this is the only hypothesis. There are a lot of hypotheses, right? I'm just picking on one for now, right? So, okay, what this means is I have to learn on a sequence of tasks now. I'll have some simple tasks and maybe some complex tasks later on. So I have my task one, I have my data x, and I have my labels y, and my function is f, right? 
I, I train this network, I'm very happy. I come to my next task. Yes, I fine tune it. I can use my fancy meta learning fine tuning, whatever you want, I fine tune it. I get a good model in task two. Now I'm like, oh, I have these weights. Now let me go back and try it on task one. Now what will happen? What? It will get worse. So Bhiksha thinks it will get worse. How many of you agree with Bhiksha? Worse on what? Uh, task one. So I, I mean, it's like, it's like say, okay, I have an image net. I trained my image net network. I wanted apples versus oranges. I fine-tuned my image net network on apples versus oranges. I come back on image net. What happens? Oh, yeah, it's for sure worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's for sure worse. I mean, how many of you think it's worse? Everyone? Everyone thinks it's worse? Yes, it is worse. It's like it forgets what it learned in the past, right? And this is the catastrophic forgetting problem, which people call. To address your question, like, I mean, does it forget? Yes, it forgets. If you're doing task one, you go to task two, you forget how to do task one. Right? And this is a big problem right now. Now, how do we deal with this? Oh, I mean, should we go? Or is it like almost 10? Or maybe five, five more minutes? OK. So, OK. So, I mean, this problem is not a, con I mean, it's not, it's not a contrived problem. And if, even if you have a very simple task, right? For example, I take MNIST digits. OK, I have these MNIST digits. This is my training set. This is my testing set. OK, I train on this. I test on this. Everyone knows I'm going to get 99% accuracy or more than that. Right. Then I rotate it, I train on it, I test on it, oops, my accuracy reduces. Right? Just a simple rotation, nothing complicated. I rotate it, rotate it, by the time I've trained on this, by the time I come back, I'm going to, nothing is going to be left. Right? I'm going to be pretty bad at classifying MNIST digits. Right? So even for these very correlated examples, there's only rotation is changing, nothing else is changing. You'll still see this issue happen even in those, these kind of examples, right? So how do we deal with this in machine learning? We are like, well, you know, it's never the case I see only this data and then this data and then this data. What I do is I pool all my data together. So I, I get all the data together at once and then I sample batches from that data. So what it is that ensures is that each batch has the same distribution as my entire data set, right? So now this assumption is valid because we try to make it valid, right? We, are, we don't know how to deal with non-IID data, so we are like, okay, we know how to work with IID data, so let us make a non-IID data IID. Right? I mean, does everyone know what IID is? Pretty much, okay, fine, yeah. So this is what we are doing. So but in the real world, data is often not bashed. Right? I mean, even if you look at babies, they start off, I mean, first they're trying to just move their limbs. At some point, they try to understand what their hand is. They're like, oh, this is my hand. Right? And then they're like, oh, I can actually use my hand to move objects. And so there's a continual process. Right? You learn one thing, you learn the second thing, you learn the third thing. It's not that the baby is getting everything together. Right? It's not getting the picking data when it is also doing the reaching. Right? Everything is happening in a continuous manner. So then we can go into the context of reinforcement learning also. Right? For example, I'm going to tell you that this is a game. Okay, and here's this agent playing the game. What's happening over here? I mean, I'm completely clueless. I mean, I see this guy it kind of goes left and right and sometimes just ends up somewhere and the whole thing restarts. Right, what, what the heck is going on? Right? I mean, what if I told you this is just a re-rendering of this? Right? I just re-rendered the textures. Now you suddenly know, for example, where are the ladders, where's the enemy, where's the person, where's the key, what the goal is. You probably have to go to the key and then go to your door and open it up. Right? I mean, everything becomes super clear to you the moment you see it. Right? Now I can do the same thing. Okay, let's see. I mean, as humans, you can actually measure how much time they take, how many times they die, and so on and so forth. And then you can measure the time in this version of the game. I mean, as expected, it's like much higher, right? You're much, much worse 
on playing this version of the game. Let's do the same experiment, but with reinforcement learning agents, right, instead of humans, right? So now we're going to make slightly simpler games because those games are too big for RL agents to solve, right? So we get humans playing this one and this one, you get like, okay, humans take twice the amount of time on this version. Now you put in RL agents, flat, right? Equal amount of time. There's no difference for an RL agent when it looks at this screen or it looks at this screen or this screen, right? It takes exactly the same amount of time to solve both the games. And so what's going on over here? It's kind of telling you that there's a lot of prior knowledge which we as humans are bringing in, but these RL agents don't bring in, they start from scratch, right? The only prior knowledge they might have is convolutions. And apart from that, they really don't have much prior knowledge. Right? So for them, it doesn't really matter. Right? So I mean, if, I, if I want to build agents which can solve tasks faster, which is one thing we began with, so should we then build in prior knowledge into these agents? Right? I mean, how, then, how do I build in this prior knowledge? So one possibility is I'm going to hand design it. I want to say this is an object, this is a ladder, this is X, this is Y. Right, that's one approach one can take. Second is, no, no, I don't believe in trying to define all of this grammar, it's going to become super complicated, super tough, I want to learn from my experience. I want to learn what these priors are by trying to interact with my environment. Right? So how do I learn from my experience? Right? So if I, the moment I start saying I want to learn from my experience, I end up in this process where I have to do task one, task two, task three, task four, right? I have to learn in a continual fashion. Because that's the only way I can learn more and more about my environment, right? And that's one of the reasons why transfer hasn't really worked in reinforcement learning setups is we don't have a good solution to continual learning, right? So, so how do we deal with this continual learning catastrophic forgetting problem, right? Any suggestions? I mean, okay, just think very, very simple. Don't think complicated. Very, very simple. The simplest thing comes to your mind. Uh, you remember where you came from, so you just head back there? You remember where you came from. <laughs> so, I mean, so what do you mean? So, if I am Imaginet and became apples and oranges, where, where did I come from? You, I know, maybe, well, simplest way is just throw the set of weights. Throw the set of weights, right? Simplest way, just throw the set of weights, right? The first thing, just remember weights for each task, <laughs> right? It's just, simple things are good. You start with simple things and then you build on simple things, right? So this is exactly what this paper did in 2016, Progressive Networks. They simply just stored the set of weights, right? It's precisely what they do. Now I'm just, okay, so, okay, here's some nomenclature. I'm going to explain the figure from their paper. So therefore, so you have a target task which is shown in blue. Okay, the, the typical way we would train for it is say, this is my target task, I'm going to train from scratch, right? Second, you can say, well, I already have trained on some source task, which is say ImageNet, I'm going on apples for oranges. I'm only going to, I'm going to freeze the two things below. So anything which is dotted is frozen, right? So I'm going to freeze the two layers and only going to fine tune the top layer, right? Okay, a reasonable baseline, we have discussed this baseline, right? Third is, well, I'm going to freeze even my, I'm going to allow everything to change. All the layers can change, right? Okay, let's skip this one, it's not interesting. Okay, fifth is I have got, this is my task one, which I did. For task two, I'm going to construct one more set of weights, which is almost identical. I'm going to freeze my first set of weights, but I'm going to put these features as additional inputs to my second task. So if there is some correlation in the second task from task one, I can still make use of that, but there's additional information that I can learn through my second stack which I'm building, right? So in a way I'm not forgetting what stack one is doing, but I'm making use of it if there is any information, at the same time learning my second stack, right? And you can go to three tasks like this. Now, do you like the solution? I mean, do you like the solution? It works. It works. I mean, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a starting point, right? It's a starting point that we have. And the next question which comes up is, okay, can we do something smarter than storing all the weights? 
Any suggestions? Can we do something smarter? Mean of the two parameters. Maybe, yeah, I mean. So you first do weights one, you do weights two, and then you take a mean of them. It may work, it may not work. Yeah, I mean, maybe some people tried it. I mean, it, these are high dimensional spaces. It, it might end up working. I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. Will that work or not? It might. Um, when you say storing the weights directly, we can just uh, realize the gradients that will uh, be, uh, the steps we're taking to move from the original weights to the new weights. Yeah. So that whenever you have to move that, you can just factor it. Even if you have to move to a shortcut, you can just go along the same direction. Then you have to store all the gradients. Gradients are the same dimensionality as the weights. That's every time step you store gradients, are going to explode, right? It's going to explode a lot. Right? So I'm going to make this short circuit because I do want to go to Deepak's talk for a bit. <laughs> so, okay, the intuition is you only try to change, okay, just forget this figure. I should have done it better. I have not done it that well as this figure could be, but the intuition is, okay, I, okay, I have, I, this is like task, the set of, this is a parameter space of say task one. I found a solution theta star A, right? And now this is task B, and anywhere over here is a good solution for task B, right, in this ring. Now if I just try to move towards task B, I might follow this green arrow, right? So this is what catastrophic forgetting does. I end up somewhere in the middle, or I might end up over here, and I'll just forget everything about task one. If somehow I want to find this direction where there's an intersection. So I can preserve information about A, but still also do well on B. If I can somehow figure out what weights are super important for task A and freeze them, let all the other weights change, right? Then I can preserve information about task A and let the other weights change, right? So that's exactly the intuition behind this method. So this loss function is saying, okay, I want to minimize my loss on B, but I only want to change weights which are not informative of task A. That information over here is given by Fisher information. Now what that is, you can look it up on Wikipedia, you'll find it, it's in the paper. Where the intuition is, don't change the weights which are important for A, right? So, okay, sounds reasonable. So what will happen with this method? If I take this forward, yeah. You might not do as well on task B if you were forgetting. You will not do as well on task B as you were forgetting. That's a possibility. Given the same set of parameters, you might not do as well on task B. Yeah, that's a possibility. So what if there's no intersection between the two parameters? Okay. Then 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 there's then transfer learning will not work at all, right? If there's no intersection. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Point taken. But I think that one will apply to every method. There will be no method in which if there's no intersection, things are going to work, right? Because there's nothing to transfer in that case. So no, no matter what, whatever method you do, right? Even if you come up with the most clever method, it cannot transfer by definition because there's nothing to transfer, right? If you have no, have no intersection, there is nothing to transfer. Yeah. By the time you get to task 10, all the informative weights for that task may be mattered to one of the previous tasks. You've frozen them, and you're not going to yes. adapt at all to this task. Yes, at some, at some point you run out yeah. of free parameters, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. at some point you run out of free parameters. So there's a finite number of tasks you can store. At some point you run out of them. Yes, yeah, that, that has happened. So let's go back and see well, how many free parameters are actually there in the neural network, right? Whatever, right? Uh, okay, well, before that, I'm, this is the result figure from this paper showing that, okay, if you just do SGD plus dropout, you have your x-axis showing the number of tasks. If you're doing the standard fine-tuning, performance drops, like this is a catastrophic forgetting, right? Now, if you train one model for each task, this is your black line, and this is the method which they're proposing, right? So as you said, the performance does drop, right? It's slightly less than this task. And as you go and do more tasks, the gap increases because you have fewer parameters that you can modify. But this ends up being significantly better than this, right? So there's always a cost, there's always a trade-off. There's no free lunch, right? So anyways, we're going back to how many free parameters are there in the network anyways, right? Oh, you have a question, yeah. So whenever you learn a new task, 
Yeah. A what? Like, because we want to predict on two tasks mm -hmm. instead of one. Mm -hmm. And when we add the task, why not we add more parameters? You could do that. That's, that's a good thing too. Yeah. I mean, these people did not do it, but you're free to do it, right? I mean, for example, the, in the first paper, in the first, what we were saying was you add exactly the same number of parameters for every task. But it's too much. It's too much, right? So there's, there's a sweet spot over there. Right? You, can, you can investigate that. I don't think people have really investigated. I mean, there has been like work in the past where people have like grown neural networks unit by unit, but there's no convincing demonstration of how to put that together. So you are very parameter efficient, but also learn a lot of tasks. Right? I mean, it's, an, it's a good open problem. Yeah. So if you do something, it might end up being publishable. It might not, but it's worth a try if you get super excited about it. So, yeah, okay. So eventually you run out of capacity, exactly what you said. So is there a better way to make use of neural network capacity? Right. So, I mean, we know that once we have trained a neural network, and we train a neural network and say we have some accuracy X percent, we can prune out a lot of these parameters, right? And we'll still get like X minus epsilon percent, where epsilon tends to be pretty small. Right, so we know that, parameter, that the neural networks are very redundant in parameters. It's an interesting thing. You cannot train these networks with less number of parameters, because then they won't train. So you have to train them with a large number of parameters, but after they have trained, we can remove a lot of those parameters. Right, this is kind of what EWC, or the method before, was trying to make use of fundamentally, right? because if there were no free parameters, you could not have, like, I want to freeze something for A and then go something for B. Right? That, that can't work. So we know this property holds true in these networks. Right, so, okay, negligible performance change after pruning, new networks are over-parameterized. We know that by empirically, right? Not theoretically, but empirically, we know that. Now, so if we, so can we make use of this feature while training, right? So right now the pruning works that I, after I've trained the network, I can prune everything off, but can I make use of this extra capacity while training itself? Right? So can we make use of our parameterization? We'll have to make use of excess capacity during training. Right? So yeah, I mean, here is, I mean, one paper we put out like a couple of weeks ago. We're trying to do this, solve exactly the same problem. We're just saying, how can I train on multiple tasks simultaneously and store them in the same set of weights and still not forget what we have learned in the past? Right? I mean, I don't have any other slide after this, therefore the line says refer to paper for details. But the idea is we end up making these weights complex, and in complex spaces we can show that you can have weights in superposition that can lift together, and they don't interfere with each other during training, so you can learn multiple tasks and still not forget what you have learned in the past. Right? So if you have any more questions, we can check. Yes, you are making more efficient use of extra capacity to stuff in more information. And the formalism is in the paper. Formalism is in the paper, yeah. It's kind of you finding like orthogonal spaces and just fitting all the orthogonal spaces as much as you can. Right, but yeah, I mean the details in the paper, I, I give you the high level intuition. If you get interested, you can read the paper. It's on archive. Cool, yeah, I'm done. That's my last slide.